Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by independent funding from Novartis. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I'm Christos Boulis, Professor of Dermatology and Venerology at the Stethesis Clinicum Dessau, Brandenburg Medical School in Dessau, Germany. Welcome to this program titled Understanding the Role of Biologics in Hydradenitis Suppurativa, a journal club review of recent data and clinical impacts. Joining me today are Angelo Valerio Marzano, who is full professor of dermatology at the Università degli Studi di Milano in Milan, Italy, and Kelsey Van Stralen, uh, who is postdoctoral researcher at the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. In order to understand what we're going to discuss today, uh, we have to classify Dradenite suppurativa as a painful inflamed disease with lesions, nodules, abscesses, and draining tunnels that they are characteristic and they are typically manifesting in the body folds, namely the axillary, inguinal, inflammatory, and anogenital regions, causing extreme pain and discomfort to the patients. Patients may visit physicians for several years before they initiate any therapy, with the disease potentially getting worse, diagnostic delay of 7.2 years. We have to think about the limitations of state of care because until recently, we did not have any effective drugs except surgery. And we have now a new era. The introduction of biologics resulted in a significant reduction in disease flares. The patients report pain as the most important symptom in an international Delphi exercise, which defined the core outcome set for clinical trials in Idradenite Suprativa. Pain and discomfort have a great impact on daily activities, work, and school. In a prospective multinational study, in patients with HS, up to 61% rated their related pain as moderate, five to seven points, or higher on the numeric rating scale for pain, from zero to 10, where 10 is the highest level. There is a need to develop appropriate, effective strategies to address the pain, drainage, odor, fatigue, and flares in patients with hydradenite suppurativa. We have to take care of the holistic approach for treatment to this very difficult disease. We are lucky. In the last years, two biologics are approved for the management of hydradenite suppurativa, adalimumab and TNF-alpha inhibitor, and recently, secokinumab and indolokin 17 a inhibitor. Another biologic is in its late stage of development, namely bimekizumab, an inhibitor of interleukin 17 A and F. It is important to understand the primary and secondary endpoints that have been used in clinical research with these biologics and the implication of these data to clinical practice. Professor Marzano, Angelo, what is the rationale for choosing specific primary endpoints in clinical trials with biologics? So the, the rationale for choosing specific primary endpoints in clinical trials by biologic is to assess uh, precisely the clinical response by means of uh, scoring systems. Uh, the, the most used um, scoring system is uh, 
either the analytic supportive clinical response, I score, uh, which uh, identify responders as, as patients who achieve at least 50% reduction in the inflammatory lesions, so abscesses and nodules, inflammatory nodules, without an increase in the number of abscesses and draining tunnels relative, uh, relative to baseline, of course. And uh, this, this core system is supported as primary point by FDA. Um, so, uh, in reality, an ideal set out can measure, would need to capture uh, objective clinical response and subjective as well, the so called PROMS, which will be discussed in detail by my colleague later on, and to show uh, clinically meaningful differences uh, respective to placebo or a comparator in a disease such as HS, which is characterized by an undulating, waving course. And it would need also to be linear enough to reveal, to flash out clinically meaningful differences among active compounds in adult studies. So, um, taking into account the trials with the different biologies that you cited, uh, so there are uh, many uh, similarities, uh, in particular uh, uh, considering the, um, the, the uh, early points of assessment of the clinical response. And so uh, there is a response in a percentage varying from uh, 50 to 60 percent of the patients, leading, of course, to an improvement also in the quality of life and uh, the, the other prompts. To, to um, disclose some uh, differences among the different biologics, it's necessary to make a long-term assessment. So not just to consider just the um, early points such as the uh, week 12 and uh, week 16, but uh, a long-term uh, um, response um, up to, uh, for example, uh, week 48 or 52. And uh, this is the case of uh, Adalimumab, uh, in which uh, there is a loss of response uh, on long-term assessment um, in patients, in some patients, who achieve response at week 12 and 16. And, and this uh, loss of response for Adalimumab has been confirmed also in real-life uh, studies. So, um, in reality, in, uh, in contrast, in, for secukinumab, the clinical efficacy is maintained, is sustained up to week uh, um, 50, 52. And uh, for bimekizumab, uh, the clinical response is also maintained, and uh, uh, there is uh, over 75% uh, of patients achieving HS450 uh, at week uh, um, uh, 48, and over 55% achieving HS475 at week 48. I would like to ask you exactly on that point. Uh, are we able, using the high score 50, the classical way, to find these differences? Do we have to go deeper in order to identify a difference of effectiveness in comparison to placebo? Okay. Uh, it's possible to take into account uh, um, uh, other, to go uh, beyond uh, high score 50, um, uh, taking into account uh, the high score uh, 75, high score uh, 90, high score 100, but it's not enough uh, because the situation of drainage tunnels is not uh, considered, it's not, it's not included in the assessment of high score. And so, um, yes, the, the, uh, the, there are many drawbacks related to the high score, uh, so the lack of weighting of the different kind of HS lesions, particularly the lack of quantification of draining tunnels. Moreover, there is um, another issue, important issue, uh, the, that is the high placebo response rates. And uh, another criticism is that the wide standard, the wide standard deviation, uh, which are also due to inter, large inter and intra-radar uh, uh, variation. 
and so, uh, moreover, most trials have ruled out patients with a, a, a count uh, of inflammatory lesions less than three or with more uh, than 20 draining tunnels. And so there is a need uh, of uh, uh, a scoring system that dynamically takes into account the lesions, also complex lesions such as the tunnels. Do we have such systems nowadays? Yes, yes. The, the, these, uh, uh, system has been uh, set up by the European HS Foundation. It is the International Hydradenitis Suppurativa Civility Score System, IHS4, and uh, this uh, scoring system um, so score as uh, one, a nodule, as two, an abscess, as four, as draining tunnel, a draining tunnel. And so it's possible to make a linear uh, assessment of the HS lesions and also, second point, to uh, reclassify the, the HS in terms of severity. So take into account a mild HS with less than three points, uh, equal or less three points, a moderate HS, which is varying from uh, four to 10 points, and severe HS uh, uh, equal to 11 points or more. This uh, uh, change in uh, HS4 uh, uh, are currently used in uh, as a secondary points, uh, also primary, but uh, in, in general secondary point in a number of trials with new biologics. I would like to cite a, a, a phase four study with secukinumab in a real world population, but also a study uh, of a fa a phase three study with spesolimab, which is a, a novel drug approved for the treatment of GPP, generic pastoral psoriasis, um, which blocks the receptor of the IL-36, which is cytokine, which is pivotal in the pathogenesis of GPP, but plays a role also in the complex physiopathological scenario of HS. And uh, there is also um, another, another study closed of a phase two study with povorcitinib, povorcitinib which is a, a JAK inhibitor. And uh, we know very well in atopic dermatitis that the, the JAK stat pathway plays a role, but also in HS, there, there is a role of this kind of uh, uh, pathway in the pathogenesis of HS. So the need of object, objective linear dynamic measurement yeah. instruments yeah. has been understood. Yeah. But many people believe that it's better to have a dichotomy system. Yeah. Is there a development in this field? Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, European Hydradenati Suppurativa Foundation set up a dichotomous version of HS4, which is named HS455, which has been validated um, in uh, applying it to the Pioneer 1 and Pioneer 2 study uh, with Adalimumab. And so this, uh, uh, this is a, a third step because it uh, allows a, a, a linear um, uh, evaluation of HS lesions uh, um, in, in HS. And and this kind of uh, uh, dichotomous version of the uh, HS4, HS455, is also used in uh, trials. Uh, again, the, the study, the phase four study with secukinumab uh, in, uh, in a moderate to severe HS in the real life, in a real life population, and also another study uh, with an agent blocking uh, concurrently the tumor receptor and the uh, OX40 uh, ligand, uh, which is a phase two study. This is very interesting. Uh, do we have something more to tell the people? What about post hoc analysis? Are there yeah. clinical studies proving what you told us today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A post hoc analysis has been made on the Sanction and Sarice study with SECU, but also in BHER1 and BHER2 uh, on BIME. And uh, uh, the, 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 this post hoc analysis indicates an increased response rate with HS4 and HS455 as compared to a score. Very interesting. Are there limitations? Because we have yeah. discussed about the advantages. Yeah. Yeah. What about the problem in very severe yeah. disease? Yeah. Yeah. Particularly in very severe uh, disease, there are some limitations because it uh, may be difficult to correctly name and count in HS lesions. Particularly, I would uh, cite uh, two uh, prototypic examples. So, uh, atypical lesions such as, uh, for example, uh, uh, pyogenic granuloma like lesions that that can be seen in HS, or uh, plaque, we 
which can occur particularly in, in very severe HS in genitalia uh, due to coalescing of different uh, draining tunnels. So there are limitations, fortunately, only in the very severe cases. Kelsey, uh, we spoke up to now about the objective measurements, but the patient is the center of our interest. And we want to know what the patient feels about his disease and also what are the results of the treatment according to the opinion of the patients. We call these uh, patient reported outcome measures. What we have here? Well, first of all, I think it's very important to realize that HS has a profound impact on patients' lives. And it affects all aspects of patients' lives. It impacts their, their ability to work or to go to school. It impacts their psychological status, so they tend to feel depressed or tend to, tend to feel anxious, and it also impairs their sexual health. As you rightfully said previously, these factors are mainly influenced by the prominent pain of HS, but for example also by HS-specific factors such as drainage from the tunnels and the odour that accompanies that. When we look at the major core domains that we have set to analyse in HS clinical trials, four out of six of those domains actually involve patient reported outcome measures and then in specifically we are talking about HS specific quality of life and pain. So this means that these patient reported outcome measures are crucial to assess in HS clinical trials and unfortunately we have a lot of them and we are currently measuring a lot of them. So we are looking at HS specific quality of life measures we're looking at skin-specific quality of life measures and also generic quality of life measures. Tell us something more about these uh, different systems of evaluation. So when we look at the HS-specific quality of life measures, we are looking at instruments that measure daily activities, that measure psychological well-being and pain, but they also add an aspect of HS-specific um, important items such as, for example, mentioned previously, the drainage from tunnels and the odour that accompanies that. And I think it is a good thing to highlight the most recent HS-specific quality of life measure that we have, which is the so-called HISQUAL. That is a quality of life measure, a questionnaire of about 17 questions that has been well developed and well validated um, and includes three different domains. So it includes symptoms, which obviously is pain, but also itch, drainage and odour. It includes activity related questions. So can patients walk, can they exercise? Do they have trouble sleeping? Do they have trouble getting themselves dressed? Or does HS impact what they actually wear? For example, also does it affect their ability to work or study? Or does it impair their sexual activity? Lastly, it also includes five questions on their psychological state. So do they feel down or depressed? Or do they feel embarrassed about their HS? Do they feel nervous? Do they have concentration problems? And also, does it influence their sexual desire? Ultimately, all these 17 questionnaires, their scores can be added up, ranging from zero to 68, with higher scores indicating a more severe impact on their quality of life. Now, this is a very interesting score because it really tends to capture the specific aspects of HS, and it has also been developed with clinicians and patients together. Although it's currently not yet published in any clinical or randomized clinical trials, it is currently embedded in several academic but also industry-sponsored clinical trials. However, one limitation is that it is 70 questions and then it does take some time to fill this out for patients. It looks a little bit complicated. Go on with the next possibilities. Maybe we find one that is less complicated. Yeah, so in addition to HS-specific quality of life measures, we also have um, a skin-specific or generic quality of life measures. Looking at generic quality of life measures, one can think of the Health Status Questionnaire Index, which is a name that no one knows, but everyone knows it by its abbreviation, which is the EQ5D. And this is really helpful, it's very short, and it allows us to compare HS with diseases that are not skin specific. So for example, with IBD or with stroke. On the other hand, we have a more important one that we tend to use a lot in clinical trials, which is the Dermatology Life Quality Index or the DLQI. And this is a very easy to use 10 question questionnaire, which patients score either from relevant or not at all to very much about how the disease has impacted them over the last week. 
So patients score, for example, how itchy or painful their skin has been. They score how embarrassing or self-conscious uh, they have felt. They, for example, also score the influence of different types of clothes, if it interfered with looking after their home or doing sports or exercise, and also whether it created problems, for example, with the partner or their friend. As I mentioned, this is just 10 questions. We add them up to get a score ranging from 0 to 30, again, with the higher scores being more impaired quality of life. And we have benchmarked this that the score of 10 indicates a severely affected uh, quality of life for patients. Now, this is not just a score that we use dynamically in clinical trials. We tend to use a rate of response or a so-called minimal clinically important difference. So the minimal change in that score that the patients deem clinical, clinically relevant to them. And for the DOQI, this is defined as a minimal change of at least five points from baseline. And as we said, this is very easy. However, because it is not HS specific, it might um, be a little less responsive as a clinical trial endpoint. The major complaint of the patient's pain, what about that? Yeah, so we tend to measure pain aside from these clinical uh, or from the quality of life measures. And we do that in many different ways. There are many different ways to measure pain and we're really not yet sure what is the best measure of pain for HS. We can measure average pain or we can measure worst pain. We can measure in the last 24 hours. We can measure over the last week. Currently in clinical trials, what we see happening is that they measure the worst pain in the last 24 hours. And similarly with a DOQI, they use a numerical rating scale, which goes from zero to 10, but they do not use that dynamically. They tend to make a responder or a non-responder dichotomous outcome from that. And they do that with a so-called NRS 30. So at least 30% or one point change from baseline counts as response when it comes to pain. So, so many measures. <laughs> what you would like, to summarize, tell us something, uh, how, what our colleagues would like to do in the pra everyday practice. So what we see in, uh, in the clinical trials from these measures, for example, both the Pioneer studies for adalimumab and both the Secukinumab studies in HS have measured DOQI, they have measured pain. And what they tell us more or less corresponds. So both secukinumabs not just improve the clinical aspects of their patients, what we see as clinicians, but it also improves their lives. About 50% of patients reach that minimal clinically important difference or those five points change from baseline when it comes to the DOQI, their quality of life, after 12 to 16 weeks. However, when we look at the placebo rates in these uh, trials, we also see that they range from about 30 to 34%. So in these patient reported outcome measures, there is quite a high placebo response rate as well. On the other hand, when we look at the pain measures in the Pioneer 2 study and in the pool data from the Secukinumab studies, mainly looking at the every two week uh, arm, we see that about 40 to 45% achieve that NRS 30, so the 30% reduction in pain scores. But again, we see here that the placebo rates are about 20 to 27%. So still the everyday care makes a lot of work and happiness to the patient and we need a little bit more exact measurements to dissociate the real decrease of pain due to the treatment in comparison to the feeling of improvement. Absolutely. I have to ask you both now. Uh, our colleagues will ask exactly at this very point. You told us so much. You gave us so much information. What we will propose, Angelo, Kelsey, for the objective, which objective you propose the colleagues to use, and which subjective you propose the colleagues to use? Angelo. Uh, yes, uh, it's objective, um, how to measure. I propose, I use in, the, in my clinical practice uh, and propose to my colleagues uh, the use of IHS-4 and IHS-455. Uh, in terms of subjective prompts... Uh, <laughs> Kelsey. Yeah, Kelsey. Yeah, so I would recommend the two that I have discussed most elaborately. So I would recommend the DOQI to measure the quality of life because it's one of the easiest and one of the quickest measures that we have. And I would definitely recommend to measure pain as well using a numerical rating scale um, because it's one of the most important symptoms of HS. And for the DLQI, we have to say also it's validated in many languages, so it's, it's easier to use.
Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to another very important issue. We speak about new drugs, effective compounds. What's about side effects? What about safety? Angelo. Yes, uh, so regarding safety, there is a general issue um, with, which are the severe infections for all kinds of biologics, but uh, in reality, we had uh, a very, very low rates of occurrence of infections, severe infections uh, in the trials with uh, uh, all the cited biologics. And also in my personal experience, I had just one case of pneumonia with the limumab, but solved with the use of uh, antibiotic. Um, uh, regarding other side effects uh, related to the category of tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitor, we have some lesson uh, coming from other diseases such as psoriasis, of course, but also inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, this, uh, this side effect is represented by the so-called um, paradoxical psoriasis eruption, uh, but I prefer uh, the, the term um, paradoxical psoriasis because in reality it's a true psoriasis. The, the incidence is very, very low. Uh, other, other kind of uh, skin uh, side effects could be paradoxical, uh, can be def defined paradoxical, maybe uh, eczema reactions or or uh, like an oid uh, uh, reaction, very, very rare also with uh, the use of a uh, tumor negative factor alpha inhibitor in other diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, regarding um, IL-17 inhibitor, uh, so um, the, the, an issue uh, also coming from psoriasis uh, is uh, candidiasis. But in reality, so in the, the, the different trials with SECU, the percentage was ranging from uh, one to four percent of the cases. Uh, this uh, um, was uh, uh, up to uh, 11 percent of the cases in the study, the trial with BIME. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was just oral candidiasis, not severe candida infection involving also internal organs. It's very important to be underlined. Uh, regarding IBD, which is, um, we know uh, from psoriasis that it could be uh, IBD, but uh, in the study, for example, with SECU, uh, there were just two cases and just in the sunrise uh, trial, not in the sunshine, uh, just two cases, and uh, probably uh, there was a, um, a problem of uh, uh, flushing out uh, a, latent, uh, a latent infection, sorry, a latent uh, disease, uh, and so very, 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 uh, not serious criticism, absolutely. Kelsey, uh, we have secokinumab, we will have bimekitumab, both are 17 interleukin inhibitors, both seem to be effective. We discuss about oral candidiasis. Do we overestimate the side effects in comparison to the effectiveness? I think, as Angela has just said, that the, the side effects have been relatively limited. We've only seen oral candidiasis, which has been, even in these trials, noted to be easily treated. Um, and in addition, I think the IBD, as you mentioned, has been really, really rare, and we're not sure yeah. if there is underlying IBD that we have um, have flared up with this. So I do think that the side effects are, are manageable, absolutely, in this patient population. Thank you very much. So, dear colleagues, we learned that individual treatment is required, and new effective therapeutic options exist. We also learned that the rapid development in intradenide superativa leads to the need of guidelines. Why? Because the development is so quick that not every physician is able to get the last knowledge. So we need to address systematically the therapeutic options. And uh, for this, uh, we have first to understand that we have two major phenotypes of the disease. One is the inflammatory phenotype, and we have to classify the inflammatory phenotype to mild, moderate, and severe, according to the HS4. And on the other side, we have an apparently non-inflammatory phenotype, which needs surgery, and then we can decide the level of surgery by HLA-1, no surgery, HLA-2, local surgery, HLA-3, radical surgery. So this is very important for the beginning. And of course, we need combinations, because not every lesion of the body is only inflammatory or only non-inflammatory. Now, knowing that, uh, the new guidelines have been set, and we see uh, now have in a few days probably the German guidelines being published, and the Europeans will follow. We 
classify the guidelines according to these new associations. I mean, we speak about guidelines for inflammatory disease, and then we advise clearly for some treatments that were validated also in clinical studies, like doxycycline, uh, which now can substitute, according to the European study, the combination of clindamycin and rifamycin, which was difficult in several countries. And then we have two biologics, adalimumab and secokinumab, and of course we have also combinations. So these are very strong leading treatments, and we have a lot of other treatments that can be added on or as alternatives in case that we have specific needs. On the other side, of course, we have also the guidelines for surgery, where we can define exactly what kind of surgery at which localization and when. And we don't exclude, in no case we exclude the combination. So if we have more inflammatory disease, of course we can make medical treatment and add on later on in a better condition surgery. Also in the apparent non-inflammatory, you can have surgery, but in any case, you can add on medical treatment in order to improve further the patient. So I think we have learned many things, many new things today. And uh, you see things uh, are improving for our patients. We have a new dynamic linear outcome measurement, uh, different instruments, the HS4, HS455, both of them coming by counting of lesions, very quick, very easy to use system. We have the introduction of patient reported outcomes in clinical studies, very important. We have the classification of intradenite suprativa to address either medical treatment in mild, moderate, and severe, or surgical treatment in Harley 1, 2, and 3. And we have new effective biologic compounds, antibodies, that are available and more are upcoming. So, Kelsey, Angelo, thank you very much for your great discussion and contribution. And I also thank you, our participants in this activity, for giving us the possibility to provide you with new knowledge, with current possibilities of treatment, this very difficult disease. We have to treat them early in order to avoid the very severe disease, and we have to use optimum ways. And this is what we presented you today. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.